Welcome to a special edition of Whitetail Rendezvous. What's so special? Well, I've asked six of my friends who live out here in the Rockies and are DIY archery hunters to share tips, techniques, and resources that they use to be very successful elk and mule deer hunters. One thing you got to remember, April 4th, 2017 is the closing of applications for applying for limited elk and mule deer. All the mule deer tags in Colorado are by draw only. Now, there's many areas in Colorado where you can apply for an elk or you can choose to take an over-the-counter tag. As you might imagine, there's fewer hunters in the limited draw areas, but you still can get a tag and we have hundreds of thousands of acres of fire service land so you can pick the place you want to hunt. Talking about picking a place, there's no better research tool than GoHunt.com Insider. And I have Brandon Evans as a guest on the show, and he's going to lead off telling you why GoHunt.com is the place to go, why Insider will give you all the information that you need to know about hunting Colorado. Why? Because I wrote many of the big game unit profiles. What does that mean? You're going to find at GoHunt.com how many preference points it takes. What's a class of trophy that's in there? Is it a 260 bull, a 300 bull, or a 350 bull? As you might imagine, a 350 bull, if it's in a limited draw area, it's going to take a heck of a lot of preference points. It might take years, but they'll still give you the opportunity to use their resource tools to find a place that has 265 bulls, Pope and Young bulls, and you can get an over-the-counter tag. So Brandon Evans from GoHunt.com Insider is going to share how, why, when, and where you can be a successful DIY hunter in the state of Colorado for elk and mule deer. Oh, one thing I want you all to remember, you need to listen to the whole show to get the promo code. What's the promo code going to do? When you sign up to be a member of GoHunt.com Insider, you will be given a Sportsman Warehouse gift card. How much is that gift card? Well, you're going to have to listen to the end of the show to get that. Hey, folks, sit back, relax, and dream about hunting elk and mule deer in the Rockies, specifically in the state of Colorado, coming up this fall. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, and this is a special edition of DIY Elk Hunting, uh, brought to you by GoHunt.com. And I have Donnell Johnson on the phone. Donnell is the co-owner of Hunt Data. If you haven't heard about Hunt Data, Donnell is going to share what, why, and how, and, and why you should consider it being a DIY hunter from out of state, even if you're in the state of Colorado. Donnell, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. It's awesome to be with you today. So, Donnell, let's let's just get the promo out of the way in, in a minute or two. Uh, tell people about uh, Hunt Data and why they should consider utilizing uh, Hunt Data uh, for their DIY hunt in the Rockies. You know, uh, Bruce, when I moved here back in 1991 and we started hunting here, uh, it was pretty overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot of national forests in Colorado, and we have some of the biggest elk herds um, in the nation. And um, there's a lot of public ground, but you have to know where you're at, the boundaries. You have to know by season what time of year you can be in there. And it was very overwhelming to know just where to start. So um, we actually have two different products. One of them is Big Game CD that helps you know um, all your preference points and all of that success rates. But the one that has helped me the most has been our mapping digital maps that uh, I'm able to put on my PDF uh, using PDF maps. It's a Venza maps, but we put it on a smartphone, so that can be an iPhone, Droid. Um, you can throw it on a Garmin um, when you're out in the field, and you can know within nine feet of where you are. So that really helps you to make sure you're on public land and you don't step over into private land and get yourself in trouble. But more importantly, it helps me be successful because I take uh, the concentration maps that the Parks and Wildlife started uh, publishing in 2000, and that is when my hunt turned around up until 2000, I hunted for five years. I'd not shot anything. I started uh, using those maps in 2000. I've shot 17 elk since then. And some of that's combined. Some of that's archery. Some of that's late season rifle cow hunts. Uh, but it's helped me get into the concentrations of the animals where 90% of the herd is 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 going to be in a t from a 10-year study that they've done. Um, so if I go in there and apply all the hunting techniques, everything from the sense of smell and knowing that where the wind and thermals are happening and doing 
applying calls and, and getting up at dark 30, um, it allows me to get into where the herds are most concentrated so that when I'm doing all those successful hunting techniques, I have a chance of seeing animals and therefore I have a chance to shoot one. So um, it's just a great product. Um, truly, the last five years, my hunts have been phenomenal with those those maps. We have satellite images with the land use, with the concentration, with migra- migration corridors. So it is a huge asset to me. And, and Colorado still is the best place to come and just pick up a tag at Cabela's and go up the mountain and be able to hunt the very next day or the same day. So we're, we're the only state you can do that in. Thanks for that. And folks, um, at www.huntdata.com and check them out. I use them exclusively for my sheep hunt last year and I got into sheep every single every single day I was in the right place. The sheep were there and I couldn't have done it without Lisa Thompson and Donnell Johnson's uh, help from Hunt Data. Having said that, okay, I'm Susie um, and I'm sitting in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I love the Hunt Whitetails and and I'm really successful at it. And I've always heard stories about coming out west and hunting the Rockies for elk because it's, you know, it's it's a wonderful place to be and it's majestic and the elk are screaming and they hear, I've heard bugles. And so <laughs> help, help, help Susie from Green Bay get to the Rockies and, and get on some elk. <laughs> You know, what? There, there would be my very first question I would ask Susie is, do you want to use your bow or do you want to use a muzzleloader or a rifle? Um, because that makes a difference as well. Um, muzzle loading is pretty much exclusive through the draw. Um, and so Susie would need to make sure, like this year, I think it's April 4th, that she'd have to make sure that she puts in for the draw. Now, if Susie's okay with doing an over-the-counter rifle hunt, um, that would be a second, third, fourth season. Um, if she wants to do archery, which is about a 30-day season that starts around April 25th, um, she able to to go into those um, over-the-counter units so then now she may ask me well what, what's an over-the-counter unit that's where i pull out my big game cd and i'd say you know show me the units that are over the counter and it lights up we, we actually have a, a map they can load to her smartphone or to google earth and and she can actually we have it color-coded so she can know if she, make sure that she's within a unit um, that is an over-the-counter and over-the-counter just means it requires zero points so i again i can go to any licensing agent anything from walmart Mark Bass Pro Cabela's, I can go pick up an uh, uh, over-the-counter tag, and I can go up there, and as long as I'm within those season dates, um, and again, let, let's say Susie loves archery because she doesn't like it when it's cold, and she d- likes the, change co- the changing color of the leaves, um, so then I would recommend we would pull up some of those over-the-counter units, so then I would start to say, well, you know, where, what's logistically, I would start to look at those concentration maps, those summer ranges, because summer's going to be when archery season's going on. That's we don't have a lot of snowfall during archery. It can happen, um, but they're pri- primarily going to be in the summer ranges. Um, we also have spring ranges where they're having their calves between May and June. But typically, I'm going to zone in on a summer range that's going to be in a, a diagonal red color on our maps. And so I would load that map to my phone. Um, we actually in Big Game CD have recommendations how to hunt each of the units and from various people. But I would focus in on that map and that tool when she hits the ground. We actually even show the cl- closest logistics. And, and where she'd need to stay. But what's fun about our land use maps, they'll show trailheads and they show campgrounds. So she can make a plan from there, whether she has a tent or if she's going to get a, a motel room in town. Um, I'd, I'd ask her, you know, how adventurous is she? Would she want to be able to, to be out there with the animals? And does she want to pack all that extra gear? Does she have all that extra gear? Because it can be overwhelming, you know, the very first time you go, because it's it's not, it, it costs a lot of money at the end of the day to buy a tent and a really good sleeping bag and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you know, I don't want that to be a barrier to her. So if it is, I would pick a place where she could drive into services, whether that's a thirty-minute drive at night to get into a hotel. If if she just is thin-skinned and she doesn't want to be out there in the Rockies, but if she does and she does have the gear, then I would recommend that she stay out as close as she can to where she's hunting. Obviously, not in the animals because I see people make that mistake a lot. They'll put their tent right where they're coming through in the morning and the evening, and their scent blows the animals out. So you know, you got to pay attention to things like that as well um so i would help her with those maps when we moved here from texas we're not texans but (laughs) um, it was pretty overwhelming just to know where to start there's a lot of rocky mountains and there's a lot of help (laughs) and thank
thanks for that. And you know, so um, so he is going to put in for tags. She does draw her tags. She's notified by the uh, DLW, and she does have a friend uh, that's coming along. Um, and so, and she is a ventress. So um, she's decided. You know, I'm I'm going to either do it one or two ways. I'm going to go DIY all the way, set up my own camp, and 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 just roll with what we have, or I'm going to do a drop camp. And uh, a lot of folks out there um, who um, want to hunt um, the Rockies don't have the gear and don't want to go spend a couple thousand dollars that would take the gear up and get the mountain tent. I'm not talking about a Walmart tent. I'm talking about things that can stand 30 miles an hour winds, snow, rain, sleet, hail, and everything in right. in September. This is September, folks, and that's reality. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Right, right. And so it's done out been there done that and you, it does happen it, it, it does, does happen. happen so you have to have good gear so saying that one option uh is, is a drop camp and then you have to go to places like go hunt or hunting fool or mike eastman's um journal and check those people out um go hunt is sponsoring this so we I, actually we actually go ahead yeah go ahead sorry I was saying, no, we actually have that in our um bmcd as well we have the outfitters in there and so you know there's a lot of places to get them i'd recommend go to go hunt and insider and and check it out there but having said that so we're we're just going to assume that Susie and and her friend uh, you know they're they're pretty good athletes and they're going to they're just going to do it DIY in the mountains and so they're going to have to get to a trailhead um they may take a break um the season lasts what almost 22 30 days doesn't it Darnell it's close, it's close to 30 days. It, it is. It's a, it goes like the, about around the 25th of August to around the 26th of September every year. You know, it's basically going through that last Sunday um, of the of the month. But, yeah, you get you get almost a solid 30 days. And notoriously, I end up dropping my animal the last day. <laughs> That's just how it goes. <laughs> and one thing I would say, if, if, if you're coming out, and I'll ask uh, Dalnell to chime in in a minute. But, you know, if it's 30 days, don't, you know, I don't know how much vacation Susie has. But she needs, I would say, at least 10 days, uh, especially the first year. Because um, year one and year two, you're just finding out how to do this year three is when you're going to really know you're all lined out and you you'll you know be able to get into elk anytime you want and and close the deal your thoughts on that donnell you know, one of the things we do, because we have a couple of friends that have uh, got into hunting, she brand new, just like you said, they were in Missouri and they wanted to come out. We actually took a, quite a crew this year out. And so what we had them do is we had to break it up. We had them break it up. We had them come out around Labor Day weekend because that, that's one less day they have to take off work. Um, you are running into a few more hunters, but the elk haven't been pushed around too much then. So um, you can actually have a better chance to seeing more, but it's harder because they're not coming into calls. However, having said that, this year, I've had a lot more success using lost calf calls and um, the elks are, they always, the elk always respond to a lost calf. So the lost calves, they don't get lost just during the rut. So the lost calf call is a call that um, even I've even seen bulls respond to. Um, so, and, and there's another thing you can do too. Like if they're kind of want to come, they're trying to watch your budget, they could even get just a cow only archery tag. There's such a thing as a cow only over the counter. Um, some people will do that just because sometimes it's easier. There's just seems like there are more cows in the world, but it's easier to call in a bull. But having said that, I've called in cows with the lost calf. So, um, but I, what we did with these guys is they came out about five days. They took off two days vacation, wrapped that in with Labor Day. So they're really only taking two days vacation. They can do like a five day hunt on the front end. And then we have them blocked off that last week because that's when the elk are in rut. That's when you can get them a little bit more hot on your hyper hots, which is just a, a estrus cow call when the, the cows are in heat um, and the bulls just get a little stupid then they make more mistakes i mean the reality at the end of the day is you keep doing absolutely everything right and you try to get them to make a mistake and you keep doing that every morning you get up at dark 30 you get out there you watch your scent you watch your thermals you watch which way the wind's blowing if you kind of know an elk's in an area but the wind's wrong don't do it you're going to push them out um, be patient wait on that wind to turn um, maybe it's you know one of the things we find where we'll find the elk maybe it's a better evening hunt just based on the wind um, so don't just say you know well screw the wind i'm going to do this anyway um because that's not going to work in your favor they, they they very much are they smell great they see great they hear great so you you have to use all of those things but by the time they start to get in rut that's when they start to make more mistakes um they get a little nutty as they say but 
Well, we're going to give a shout out to uh, uh, a friend that everybody knows, Wayne Carlton. And I think last time we talked, you talked, uh, told me that he's he's got a new lost calf call on the market. Is that correct? He does. It's called the Green Weenie, and I absolutely love it. It's it's a lime green color. If you go to Native by Carlton, is his new website, Native by Carlton. Um, it's a it's called the Green Weenie. He's, I think it sells for around twenty. He's making custom elk calls now that are w- high high quality high quality calls. Um, this is a new effort on his part. But he also has come out with a three D um, decoy, and it's called Butthead. And the nose on it is three dimensional. So he took a, a, an artist and a, a photo of an actual elk and they made that that nose is so realistic with the you know i sit there and look at it when we have them in our in our booth and we're selling them and it's just it looks so real um and one of the things he did with the backing on it he put an extra a layer in there so that when the sun comes through it um, so on some of the other decoys you'll they're more silk screens and you can and they when the sun is shining on them they don't look as real um so the, he put a backing on it so that you don't get the sun shining through it but um he actually actually flags with it a little bit like you would a goose goose hunt you know he he'll 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 put that head up higher if the elk's further out then he'll put it in the ground and he'll be calling you know the whole time but so there is a combination of both of those um we we lisa and i took that out um i was afraid to take it out during muzzle loading for obvious reasons um but when the muzzle loading, that's when i got a hold of it it's a brand new product um and when we got a hold of it and that last week um we took parks and wildlife out on a video shoot and we we were hiking calling just doing a lot of call, all kinds of calls when, when, when lisa and i call we try to just sound like a herd because we're not quiet when we move so we just try to make it sound like it's a herd moving through and it's worked for us many many times um so i'll be cow calling she'll be cow calling we'll throw out a bugle we'll do a couple uh dueling bugles against each other we'll go back to cow calling and um, we just get all that going so it just sounds like herd talk and um and, w- and when we stopped we threw the decoy out we backed in the trees and within five minutes we had two different bulls that came in it was over the counter unit so it was an area i'd never even been to um so it, we just did it in faith and uh truly um when you get towards that last week you can call those bulls in you just got a lot of information, but um, let's re- recap. Wayne Carlton, uh, Wayne Carlton, um, uh, what? Native by Carlton is his website. Say that again, please. Native, Native by Carlton, N A T I V E B Y Carlton, C A R L T O N. So check you can it see out. all his new products. Yeah, so. check it out. Wayne, yeah. Wayne, as far as I know, um, way back when, when I was starting elk hunting, um, he came out with his Kiki Run uh, elk call turkey call turn into an, um, uh, an elk call. So Wayne's a heck of a guy. He's great for the industry and, and props you, uh, Wayne Carlton. So let's get back. Okay. So, so Susie's in green Bay. Okay. What kind of, how much shape or what kind of shape does Susie need to get in, you know, to not get her butt kicked by the Rockies? You know, the, the thing is the better shape. I mean, I would challenge myself to, to the max. I'd join the gym. I'd walk at night. Um, the reason being, you know, and I know you talked to Lisa about this on one of her interviews but you know that is the one roadblock that we we get into we get guys that spend all this money they come out here they pay the out-of-state fees to be here um and they just they end up hitting a wall that first day whether it's from not having good shoe gear or you know something you know i know she talked with you about you know somebody gets out there and gets really bad blisters the first day they're pretty much shut down for the rest of the hunt because they're in a lot of pain um so you know getting in shape is huge i've, I've had so many guys you know i'll literally be walking the first 300 yards and they'll look at me and they'll say how much further <laughs> and I'm like we're in trouble if you're already asking me that question um, and so you know obviously in aerobic shape you know I had somebody the other day say well I should just be in fact you know we were helping a guy build a strategy about three days ago and he said I just need to go to the gym and lift weights and I said you know that's not going to hurt you but what's going to help you is aerobic um, if that's getting um, on a you know a treadmill or whatever that is where you're building up that core strength you know where you can walk three to five miles. Um, and then if you have the beauty of, of and the blessing of actually getting something, that's a whole nother world because you're putting a lot of weight on your back and getting that meat out of there in a timely fashion. So, 
um, truly, that has been the biggest, one of the biggest roadblocks I've had with people. And, and the thing you can't get in shape for is just that trying to catch your wind. You know, when you get out here, that's still, you want to give yourself at least a day to adapt. There's so much about high altitude training. Um, I was in a class years ago uh, with one of the al- high altitude training guys, and he knew better. He was one of the instructors. His brother flew in from Saudi Arabia. He picked him up at the airport. He drove up to Gunnison. He had horses that took them up to about 11,000 feet. And his brother got violently ill. And the, the, the answer to that is to come back down the mountain, which he knew that. But he said he ran into a six by six on the way down and had a big shot. But, um, but you know, it's just you have to let yourself acclimate. So, like, our crew that came from Missouri, we had them come to Denver. We had them spend the night. Then we went up to 8,000 feet, had them spend the night. Then we went and hunted. Um, because your you're, high altitude sickness is not fun. Um, so there still is getting in shape. And then there's that piece of you, you can't really – Somebody can be in the best shape in the whole world, but if you try to go from zero to 11,000 feet, um, you're not going to find too many people that do well with that. you got to let your body acclimate, your blood acclimate to the oxygen levels. And um, My two cents um, is um, hydrate, hydrate. You have to drink water. Amen. Uh, every single um, every single minute, and I'm talking about seven um, what seven fifty milliliters, um, you know, an an hour. Uh, and then the other thing I did, I went to M, uh, uh, Web MD, and I looked up. Okay, do I talk take the Mocasil? That's for really high altitude, and I was only at thirteen fourteen thousand feet. And um, <laughs> that's a joke, folks. And <laughs> and and I looked at everything. And the best thing I found was ibuprofen, six in the morning, six at noon, and six at night, and check with your doctor, and then hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And I only ran into a problem twice in 22 days. And, um, you know, so it worked for me. I'm seven years old. Yeah, I got in good shape. I, I covered 100 miles or more before my hunt. And during my hunt, uh, you know, I, I went over on another 100 miles. And can anybody right. do it? Yeah, yeah, you can. But one is the attitude that you have, and then you have to yep. plan. And just like Donnell said, they were working with a guy today or last week about a hunt plan to not only hunt, but to get in shape to hunt. And so many people, uh, you know, they'll they'll come out, they'll have they'll hang in the bar, then they'll you know try to hunt. And if you're a flatlander, that's below anything below uh, a mile high, uh, five thousand feet. Then um, don't do that to yourself. Don't waste thousands of dollars in your time because the mountains will kick your butt. Your thoughts? Absolutely, it's one hundred percent correct. And and it's clear fluids. We tell people um, limit your alcohol. Cons- consumption, your caffeine consumption, um, and and just push those fluids. It absolutely helps, and it's just necessary. And and, it, and it's up to you if you want to. You know, again, you're you're going to be spending, you know, a good amount of money to be here. So why not be in shape? I mean, at a minimum, I, I take my 81 year old father hunting. Um, the one thing he did two years ago is he was just walking three miles at night. I mean, it made a huge difference having him do that from prior years when he's been here with me. Um, now, obviously, I don't take my dad on some of the stuff that I would archery hunt. But um, he's still having to drive, you know, walk in some of those inclines, and and you know he has a pacemaker. He always wants to make sure that everything comes out good in the end. So um, if you even at a minimum, even if you can start to wear your backpack and walk around the block, because it's just different muscles, you know, that that you're using. So you can start out with the backpack, make sure you're wearing the shoes you're going to be wearing, so your feet are accustomed to that. Good socks. Um, I like different wool blends, um, you know, that just when you get them a little bit wet, that it, they don't stay soaked on you i I avoid cotton um there's so much good gear out there today um and uh you know a lot of a lot of the different gear and sick and all of the different ones that just really um once you sweat they they you know they dry quick and what a difference than if you wear this cotton shirt that just stays wet against your body because that affects you too when you you go to sit down and then you get chilled um i mean that's probably the second um faux pas if you will that you get into is that people will get cold really quick and they just don't have the ability to sit there and be patient because when you're moving around it's hard to get a shot especially if you're an archery hunter you, the more you're set up with a decoy and calls and and you're camouflaged into your uh, background your your chance of getting a nice solid shot off uh, quality shot um it, it is so much better than if you're hiking around so you know what the thing that we do when we're hiking is we're trying to find where they're at 
Um, Because we'll start out, you know, we we have so many different ways that we do hunt. We'll go to a spot where we have maybe done trail cameras. I did trail cameras this year, um, had the the elk completely nailed down. I was so excited. But, man, all it was was two days, and the -the over-the-counter traffic really pushed those guys around. And once the hunt started, I we got into elk, and and my husband got an elk opening weekend. Um, I had a shot that I had one jump the string on. I have it on video. And um, I actually shoot a Carbon Air fifteen hundred dollar bow, and it was crazy that this this elk. Uh, but but my problem was on that was my there was just a little bit of noise when I released, and Lisa was about a hundred yards from me, and she heard me shoot. So that's not a good thing. So with your gear, I mean, when you get out there, you know, um, we like to get set up and shoot and shoot some practice shots when we're up there. Make sure we didn't knock anything. That's the thing with a with a bow. There's so many things that <laughs> you're always tweaking um, and just making sure. I had one year called in six six by sixes the first two i missed and i was like what is going on um come back start shooting at my targets and sure enough my peep sight the string on it had come loose and it had slid maybe a fourth of an inch but it was just enough that i was shooting over their back um the good news is nobody got hurt the bad news is i missed two nice the the good good news is i still got a six by six that season with my bow but um you know you just but i mean i wasn't guaranteed that and i didn't get that shot again until the last night so Make sure your gear is good. Make sure you use your gear once you get to where you're going to be hunting. And thanks for that. And one thing I'd like you to address, what happens every afternoon in September in the Rockies? Every afternoon? Well, mostly every afternoon, weather, weather-wise. Oh, yeah. You know, you, from, from a sprinkling raining, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, to thunderstorms and all that. Yes, yes, yes. And you have to pay, you have to pay attention to that, too, because you're, you're up high, and um, if you get in, got some good lightning going on, you want to get out of there. It's just not something you want to mess with, especially where you were sheep hunting, probably. But, you know, in the afternoon, the, the rains will come in, and you've got, you've got to have the good gear for it again. Um, <laughs> Lisa and I, it, it's kind of a catch-22, because um, two years ago, Lisa and I, man, it seemed like it just rained all the time I don't know if it's two or three years ago but anyway um, we just we had so much rain that year but the, the cool thing about rain now obviously you have to watch for for the lightning because it's a big deal when you're up high um, but that particular day it wasn't lightning it was just raining really hard and um, we I had a bull elk that I came within about five yards of I was well, I was coming down we were actually coming out for the we were done with the evening hunt and I actually about run into about a he's either a five by five or six by six was a nice bull. Um, he came around the corner, and I came around the corner. But because because of the rain, um, this my scent was completely um, dampened. You know, what I mean, so it was hard for him to smell me. So you know, it's one of those things. Lisa and I always say, um, a lot of times, you know, when you're out there in the Rocky Mountains, you're competing. When, especially when you're in over the counter unit, you're competing with other hunters. Um, so sometimes, if you're the tough guy that has the gear for it, and you've got good rain gear um, to get out, sometimes you actually have some advantages with the animal because they, they they can't pick up your scent because that rain pushes it down. And so we've had a lot of luck in the rain in terms of getting really close to the animals because they just, you, it makes me realize how much my scent probably blows, blows uh, messes up a lot of my plans when I think I just am not seeing anything. Well, in fact, I think they smell me and they're out of there before I get through there. But, um, but truly when it rains, we've seen a ton of animals. It doesn't mean the hunt's off, but um, you do have to watch the lightning for sure. And then I'll just my Bruce's two cents. Um, a heavy rain, it'll blow through. The wind's going to come up. It's going to be nasty. Hunker down, because after the the rains go by, the the clouds go by, is it turns nice again. Plus, everything's washed. What I mean, you're washed, your gear's washed, the scent is washed away, and and the and the animals they'll get up because they're just like you. They kind of don't want to feed. They will feed in the rain, but when it's really nasty out, they'll kind of wait. And as soon as the sun comes up and you get the whole evening hunt, you can have some fantastic hunting uh, during that period of time. Your thoughts? Absolutely. And you know, you'll even see that in a snowstorm where it seems like nothing's happening. And then the sun comes out the next day and everybody's extra hungry because they've kind of hunkered down, you know, and, and it just seems like everybody's active again. And like you said, everything's fresh. So any tracks you see are fresh. Um, and so it just, yeah, it's like it resets everything. And truly in terms of scent, it's a great thing. I really, I think it helps you out. So I used to get discouraged with rain, but um, after we've had some good experiences around it, like, like Bruce said, if you can get 
some good gear, hunker. I, we, you know, we'll even back into a cedar tree when you get, you know, way underneath it. Um, sometimes it's nice and dry in there, you know, so depending on, you know, what that setup is. But um, it's definitely worth still getting in the field because by, by, by default, it, it eliminates your hunter, other hunters that aren't as hardcore as you probably. And ladies and, and, and guys, um, I, I know Lisa and, and Darnell are hardcore. And some of the things that they do, um, you're not going to be able to do. But if you just listen to what uh, what Lisa um, was on just a day ago and, and Donnell today, um, you can be successful. And, um, you know, their drive and tr- determination, and really, their, I guess, just their attitude of hunting and how they are determined um, exceeds their physical condition, everything. It keeps them mentally sharp and keeps them in the field. And so um, these gals are determined hunters. And, um, you know, guys, um, <laughs> if you ever hunt with them, good luck. <laughs> hey, you know, Bruce, I have one more thing to say, and, and it's one of the things we actually use our tools with. When, when you load some of our maps like to Google Earth, one of the things I tell people to, if you're looking for where you're going to end up hunting, one of the things I tell people is, is to think roadless. And what I mean by that is where it's really hard for humans to get there. And and by default, if you can see one of our summer concentrations or winter, depending on what you're hunting, winter concentration, um, if you see one of those concentrations in an area that it's roadless, meaning there's not a lot of human traffic going through there. By, by default, when you get in there, and if it's in the national forest or wilderness, you are going to see a lot more animals. It's just it's just how it works. They, they not everything. Everybody thinks it's kind of like uh, going to Estes Park. Those those elk are not normal. <laughs> Most elk do not like people, and they like to be more remote and away from people. So anytime you can think roadless. So that's what's fun about loading the maps on Google Earth is you can take that bird's eye view. You can see what actual trails are there again looking at trailheads you can shade it in and out look at the actual satellite um, images and the fields behind it and the water sources and all of that and and uh, it, it'll definitely get you into um, some quality hunts and with that we're at the the, the soft stop so um, Darnell let people know how to get in touch with you and then um, give some shout outs and then we're going to wrap the show Oh yeah, th- you know, thank you again for letting me be on your show here today, uh, Bruce. Um, just a shout out to um, Hunt Data, uh, my business partner Lisa and Dave, my husband, um, who've who've endured being around me for all of this. I'm also a shout out to Mossy Oak Bass Pro, Fahrenheit Outdoors, PSE, um, and Spike Point, and just thankful for my sponsors. And um, you can get a ho- hold of us at HuntData.com, H-U-N-T-D-A-T-A.com. We have products for Utah, Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado. Um, and you also can find us on Hunt Data uh, on Facebook as well. We also have a Hunting Divas, H-U-N-T-I-N-G-D-I-V-A-S. And that's we're just trying to network with ladies who are trying to get into hunting and maybe they don't have all the gear and they want to network with some other ladies. Um, so we're constantly trying to do that and promote uh, women and children in the outdoors. So um, we also, one more shout out this Step Up, Step Out. We uh, mentor um, women and children and handicap as well and get them in the field. So if you are any of the above and you want to, you want to be sponsored or you want a mentor if you check out uh, Step Up, Step Out on Facebook. And with that, um, we're going to close this special edition of DIY Elk Hunting in the Rockies by Donnell Johnson and presented by uh, Go Hunt. And this is your host, Bruce Hutchin, uh, and to my listeners all across North America. These ladies got game, no question about it. And, um, <laughs> you know, get in touch with them because um, they're two of my favorite people. I, I enjoy the heck out of them. And, you know, they're ladies with a passion for hunting that's, um, you know, not matched by too many people in the industry. So, Donnell, thank you so much for being a guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thank you again, Bruce. As promised, here's the good stuff. When you sign up for your membership at GoHunt.com Insider, you're going to get a promo code WR2017. Again, that promo code is WR2017. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to enable you When you pay for your membership to get a $50, yes, $50 Sportsman Warehouse gift card. So here's here's the deal. You go to www.gohunt.com forward slash insider and fill out all the information. When it asks for a promo code, put in WR2017. And when you get 
verification of your membership in the mail, you will get from GoHunt.com a $50 Sportsman Warehouse gift card. Couldn't be any simpler. And I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to Whitetail Rendezvous DIY in the Rockies Special Edition. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.